Yes, indeed. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Well, we are currently in the midst of a nine-week sermon series, longer than we usually do, because we are going to talk about the three pillars of our faith life together, grace, growth, and generosity. John talked about grace for the last three weeks. Some of the promises we claim at Easter in Christ, of course, are that we have hope and new life and resurrection and the gift of eternity with God. These promises are not based on our right actions or our right confessions. They are the result of God's grace, given to all people throughout all time and everywhere. We're called to live into the gift of grace for ourselves and to then offer that grace to the world as we follow Christ. Well, this week, we're going to start three weeks on our second pillar of our life together, which is growth. There's no better time to talk about growth than in May in Minnesota. The earth is coming back to life all around us, completely exploding with new signs of growth everywhere. And our scripture passage this morning is from the book of Colossians, written by Paul from prison to encourage the Colossians to stick with growing with God. Worldly pressures were pressing in on them, and Paul wanted to make sure that they would not only live out their faith, but that they would grow in it and then bear fruit as a result. So listen now as Adam reads Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. And thanks to Autumn for reading that really run-on sentence of Paul's. (laughs) This run-on sentence that calls us to growth and new life. Well, a week ago Saturday, I took my annual trip to the hardware store where I gather all I need for the glories of the upcoming growing season. I purchased two peony cages to prop up our eight peony plants. I had six others on hand. I bought a pair of gardening gloves to add to, I don't know, the 10 other pairs I have that I've purchased every year before. It's almost like a new backpack to me. New gloves, new growing season. I also purchased six packets of zinnia seeds and wildflower seeds to scatter in our garden, and of course, a big bag of fertilizer. I went home and spent several hours putting all my new purchases to work. I pulled weeds, I planted seeds, I sprinkled fertilizer really everywhere, (laughs) and now I've been watering every single day for the last week. And every single day, I head out to see what might be coming up. And you know what I've seen so far? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing at all. No shoots of growth. No remarkable change in the plants I sprinkled fertilizer on. It kind of seems to me right now that nothing is happening out there. Do you ever feel that way in your faith life? We hear these words that we believe to be true, that we are new creations in Christ but how do we grow as new creations? And can we affect our growth? Or do we need just to wait for the gardener God to magically sprinkle fertilizer on us to make us finally grow? Now, as much as we all can sit back and intellectually say, well, growth is a process. It takes time. It's hard to wait for gardens to grow in Minnesota. And it's disappointing to see how slow we grow sometimes as well. In a world of quick fixes, we're always looking for something to help us grow just a little bit faster. 
Well, a few months ago, when we were just beginning to emerge from the pandemic, my daughter and her friends found some COVID relief at the Williston Pool in Minnetonka. Deserted, five seventh grade girls had a giant pool all to themselves where they could take their masks off and swim for an afternoon. Now, everyone knows that part of the fun of going to the pool as a kid is to burn all those calories so that you can get some really good snacks afterward. And in the case of the pool at Williston, there isn't really a snack shop there. There's something better, vending machines. Now, as adults, we see vending machines as the true sign of a desperate moment. At the time I find myself in front of a vending machine, it means that all my options have officially run out. <laughs> I am starving, and for whatever reason, I have no time to find something better to eat. But for middle school kids, a vending machine represents a little slice of heaven. Colorfully displayed behind a plate of sheet glass, candy and chips and cookies all lit up, ready for the choosing. The question is always, which one will you choose? We live in an instant gratification culture in fact, we're kind of immersed in sort of a vending machine world. Options seem to be on our display, on display for us all the time in a multitude of areas of our lives. And from our positions of power and influence, we actually have been rewarded by having experience of putting a few things into a slot and getting out just what we want right when we want it. As people with money and power, we have generally come to expect immediate returns on our investments, our investments of time, our investments of resources, and we live under the illusion that the better we execute, the faster we'll get what we want or need. Often we transfer this vending machine lifestyle into our expectations for spiritual growth. The life of, of faith becomes the search for the right technique, the proper method, or the perfect program that can immediately deliver the desired result of spiritual maturity that we're all looking for and that God promised us. The late theologian and professor Robert Mulholland wrote a book about spiritual growth called Invitation to a Journey. And it's Mulholland that actually uses this vending machine analogy to talk about our expectations when it comes to growing with God. He writes, there simply is no instantaneous event of putting your quarter in the slot and seeing spiritual formation drop down where you can reach it, whole and complete. We often view God and our churches as some sort of spiritual vending machine Adopt a new technique or sign up for that next great class and you'll come out whole and healed and done with your spiritual journey. Now, have you ever seen someone not get the, what they wanted at a vending machine? Maybe it was like it was that day with two bags of Cheez-Its precariously hanging off of E3. Anger ensues quickly when items get stuck, when the dollar bill slot is broken, or when the item we saw on the machine yesterday is gone today. When a vending machine doesn't work the way it's supposed to, people come undone, don't they? <laughs> they shake the machine, they pound the buttons again, and they even kick it if no one is watching. What do we do when we don't get the quick return we're hoping for after we've invested time in our spiritual formation and growth. I think we kick the machine in a different way by criticizing God. We start to think, okay, God, you're the one that called me a new creation now. How come nothing's happening? Why don't you do something? Or we even wonder if God has left us completely. It's our way of kicking the machine, shaking the machine even, and then we walk away frustrated and still hungry. Well, in Colossians, Paul is writing to a group of people who were faithfully following God, but they were also getting distracted by the shiny things the world had to offer them. 
They were frustrated that their faith wasn't producing results in their life, the results that they were hoping for. Following Jesus wasn't making their lives easier in any way at all. In fact, it was making their lives a little bit harder. And Paul wanted them to know that faith is much bigger than what you confess. That real faith takes time. It's slow growing, if you will. And it's growing in Christ and then bearing fruit. The encouragement to grow and bear fruit is repeated several times by Paul in his letter to the Colossians. He says that in the same way the gospel grows and bear fruits in time, we should do the same. And the ways that we should be growing are twofold. First, we should be growing in good works. And second, we should grow in our knowledge of God. First, good works. Prior to Christ's arrival on earth, the litmus test for faith was some combination between your birthright, the family and religion you were born into, and what you said you believed. Jesus arrives to say, it's not about that, actually. It's about how we serve the world, how we receive God's love and give it back out to those most in need, how we break down barriers, how we draw all people in, even those born in a different way. Good works are the thing that should come as we dig into growing with God. The second thing Paul says is that our knowledge should expand. And it's important to remember that knowledge for Paul is not intellectual. Knowledge for Paul is whole life. It's the kind of knowing that comes from personal experience, from being an expert at something. Joey has a lot of knowledge about how to play the drums. Not because he's read a lot of books about it, because he's clearly done it for a long time now. Our faith is to be the same way, Paul says. Not a collection of ideas, but a way we personally live day by day, individually, and as a community. So it's this combination of good works and personal experience or knowledge that leads us to growth. And then the natural outcome of that growth is that we will bear fruit. Mulholland writes, the very first work of transformation and growth is the reversal of the deeply ingrained and powerfully controlling dynamics of our, culturally, of our cultural shaping, that vending machine idea. This means that our spiritual journey is not about us setting out to gather a bunch of information as if God was an object for us to grasp. Instead, spiritual formation and growth is learning to yield ourselves to God, the gardener, and discovering how God will grow us, where God will take us, and how we will bear fruit as a result. As I visit my garden each day this time of year, I have to choose to believe that growth is happening so I don't run out to the garden store to just buy big plants to put in whole on top of all those seeds. I need to yield my garden over to the natural growth now that will happen, and frankly, that will have very little to do with me. Waiting for my garden to grow is slow work. It takes time and patience, and it's a pretty long wait. Our spiritual growth is similar, and when we realize that spiritual growth is a continuous and sometimes difficult process, we can be tempted that it is an option that we can take or leave, that we could decide, well, either I'm going to decide to spiritually grow or not. But the truth is, being human means we are already on a spiritual journey. There's no way out of it. Humans are designed for transformation and growth and new life, and we actually can't avoid growth. We can't stop it, and we can't walk away from it. Because one way or another, we are all being spiritually formed. The question is the same that it was for the Colossians. Are we being formed in the image of Christ, or are we being formed into the image 
of the world. Every thought we hold, every decision we make, every action we take, every emotion we have, every relationship we're in, is another chance every day to be formed in the image of Christ. All these things, little by little, shape us. And when we place them in the hands of God, they can shape us in the image of Christ. And we, when we hold too tightly to them for ourselves, we become shaped in the image of the world. Ultimately, true growth in Christ is a result of being with God that then leads us to doing in the world. But as gardeners, we often try to do first to make the being happen. Just watch your garden this summer. Your garden is not going to work hard to perform. It is simply just going to be. It's going to receive the sun when it shines or the clouds when they come. It'll take on the rain when it arrives. And it will even go dormant at times for the sake of new growth a little bit later on. So feel it or not, see it or not, just like a garden, we are already growing. The question we have to ask ourselves is how do we grow to be more like Christ? Are we sustaining ourselves on vending machine snacks from the world? Or are we taking the hand of the good gardener who leads us to the vine? and then invites us to bear fruit. As Wyzetta Community Church, may we be a community that is marked by growth. Growth that is a process that happens little by little, day by day, as we live into relationship with each other, and as we go out to serve the world. And may we trust that when we yield ourselves into the good gardener's hands, we will learn better how to be for the sake of doing. Amen.